African countries. Oh, sorry, in six African countries, um, including that South Africa, Zambia, Tanzania, Kenya, um, Mauritius, Namibia um, as well. Sorry, so it's, uh, it's six offices in five African countries. So, um, and we sit in the Nairobi office. I sit in our corporate commercial uh, department working on uh, uh, m and transactions and our ESG practice. And I am joined today uh, by Jessica, who is an associate in our projects team. Um, and we together have been advising a lot of uh, carbon projects and carbon um, uh, proponents and developers in, in, in the space. Uh, and so we're excited to be here and talk to you guys today about the regulatory framework um, uh, that, uh, of the carbon markets in, in Kenya, but also with giving you a, a bit of a flavor of what's happening in other countries. Uh, so happy to be here today with you all. And I think we'll get started. So one of the things um, uh, we ask is where everyone is in, in relation to their understanding of uh, carbon markets, carbon credits. Uh, there are some people in the room who are very advanced, already have their projects up and running and uh, really are here more for the monetization conversation because they are far advanced and there are people here who actually just want to start understanding it from the ground up. So um, when we start, we kick off, I said, before we go into regulatory framework, we thought it would be useful to get us all on the same page as to what we are talking about. Um, and so Jessica, thank you uh, for sharing uh, your screen. Uh, we'll We'll start off by just playing a, a short, a very short video, and then uh, that was prepared by Southpol, and then we will take over uh, to specifically talk about the regulatory markets. We can have to expand. So Christina, I cannot hear the audio. I'm not sure if it's just me or if other people can hear as well. Um, yes. Can you What's hear the audio? No, I cannot hear. And some people are saying they cannot hear as well. Okay. So you might need to keep your, if you are the one playing, you might need to keep your audio on, not mute. Okay. Are you, are you muted? Oh no, you have to keep your audio on. Mm. So start again. You've probably heard the terms carbon credits or carbon offsets. But what exactly do they mean? A carbon credit is a unit corresponding to the avoidance or removal of one ton of CO2 from our atmosphere. The credits are issued by climate action projects that capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, for example, by planting trees, or prevent carbon from being emitted, for example, by stopping deforestation or replacing open fires with efficient cookstoves. The number of credits generated by a project is based on the tons of CO2 it saves. To guarantee that the impacts being made by a project are happening, our carbon credits are certified according to recognized international standards. These standards provide strict methodologies to calculate impacts, a harmonized auditing framework, and regularly monitor projects. They also ensure that the climate projects are well implemented, that they could not have been developed without the revenue from carbon credits, and that they create measurable and permanent climate benefits. Once issued, each credit is assigned a unique identifier and registered in publicly available registries to ensure that it can only be counted and sold once. In the fight against climate change, carbon credits are a proven way for companies to reduce global emissions today. 
While they work hard to shrink their own carbon footprint, these investments support sustainable development in the countries most threatened by climate change and scale pioneering new climate solutions. Want to know more about supporting climate action projects and speeding up the global transition to an environmentally sound world? Contact us today. Thank you. So that was just an intro as to what carbon credits are. Uh, just so that there are people in the room who might uh, not be as well informed as others and we just wanted to get everyone on the same page. So now I will just uh, now I'll just jump into regulatory framework. In Kenya, sorry, there's a bit of an echo. Is it still echoing? I think no, I no. no, it's now normal. Okay, great. Um, so in, in Kenya, we have different things um, uh, that regulate. So I'm just going to use the Kenyan example. And then um, towards the end of the slide, I will give a flavor as to what's happening in some other African countries. So um, Kenya, the, the, there's not one law governing um, environmental and climate, um, and climate uh, change action. And so the key one is our constitution and you find very many uh, countries will have some sort of right to a clean environment uh, or, and, and certain provisions in their constitution about uh, the environment. So Kenya is not unique to that. The main act in our case that uh, deals with carbon markets is the Climate Change Amendment Act. This act was, um, or rather I should say the Climate Change Act. So it was amended recently uh, and uh, in 2023. And since then now it specifically deals with, with our carbon markets. And then there were the climate change uh, carbon market regulations that were passed in 2024 that also deal with that. That being said, anyone who's setting up a project in Kenya will find themselves actually dealing with numerous other laws. So for example, we have our Environmental Management and Coordination Act. Um, and I'll talk about this a bit more in, in, in detail because our designated national authority um, is NEMA that falls, that is uh, uh, incorporated or, or basically formed under this act. Uh, if you have any land-based projects, you'll find yourself dealing with land laws, and this is the same in any other jurisdiction. Uh, and so you, you start your project and you realize it's not just about the carbon markets. I need to deal with land laws. I need to deal with business laws. Uh, we have other natural resources laws, our Forest Conservation and Management Act for people who are doing uh, forestry projects, especially if they're using um, any uh, public land or, or uh, forests that were managed um, here by the government, and then they have to enter into certain arrangements or deal with our community forest associations. This is the act that be under Wildlife Conservation and Management Act, because there are people who are also doing things in the conservation space, um, and, and they would be governed by this, and then the Sustainable Waste Management Act. Um, again, this is this I have actually just uh, focused on uh, the things that will have a direct impact on the projects, but there are also other things which would be in terms of business registrations, local government laws um, that people need to be aware of. And so setting up a project, it will always be good to actually understand the environmental um, and, and governance structure that will affect the project. So this is just an overview, but I do want to get a bit more specific um, in, in, in terms of uh, the, the legal framework. And we already had uh, many people asking us specifically about um, the institutional framework in Kenya, I, I will talk about that, but then again, as I said, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some other countries uh, towards the end of the slide. So in Kenya, uh, with our Climate uh, Change Act, we do have the regulations that were recently published. And uh, regulations, uh, I'm finding this is a trend that is happening in other various jurisdictions, just our, our, our country, for example, down, the, down south from us, Tanzania also recently um, uh, adopted uh, similar regulations. Um, there's uh, there are some slight nuances and differences, but it it in in our case, 
what we have is that we have something called the designated national authority. So the act has appointed this DNA as the entity responsible for authorizing and approving participation in project, projects. Um, and one of the things I should have said actually earlier in the earlier slide is that is the local framework, but many other countries have signed up to international treaties such as the Paris Agreement, which then gives them as countries have made certain commitments towards taking certain climate mitigation measures. Um, and, and so they are now implementing local laws uh, as part of their responsibilities and their duties to, to, to keep up and to keep up with their commitments under the Paris Agreement. So uh, this, in our case, in Kenya's case, we have the DNA, the, designation, the designated national authority. Um, and this is, in our case, is NEMA that was uh, recently appointed and gazetted, and the other ones will be doing this. And what their responsibilities are is they have to make uh, determinations on uh, carbon project concept notes and the issuance of letters of no objections for projects that will be uh, registering in our country. Uh, they issue let letters of approval for to project proponents, again, projects that are in this country, and monitoring registration of carbon projects um, in compliance with the regulations. And the regulations really set out things that um, the, the different projects have to meet in terms of uh, requirements to continue to operate in country. Um, and so one of the things that they also have to do hasn't yet been done, and we've gotten many questions uh, constantly, and we're updating uh, some of our clients and sending out newsletters, is there are certain things that have to come in place. So, for example, committees. Um, uh, the, the Our regulations, and this is something that you'll see in also other jurisdictions, if they're, they're, they're keeping up with their commitments under the Paris Agreements, is um, there'll be a multi-sectoral technical committee and so this committee will comprise membership from government, um, from the uh, different counties. So in our case, in Kenya, uh, you have the national government and then we are split into our counties and really a lot of projects will be happening at county level. And so this multi-sectoral technical committee will in involve both national government and our county departments. Um, and then you'll have your intergovernment um, panel on climate change, but we'll also have people involved from the projects themselves. So this is the committee that hasn't yet been set up. We've been following up to see where we're at on that in that front. Um, and so far, nothing really to update on that, but um, uh, but it is in works and we, we, we have been receiving some updates from NEMA on, on the fact that these things are actually ongoing. So we're just waiting for the Gazette mention for formal notifications. There'll be the Climate Change Directorate. Uh, so the functions of the directorate in Kenya um, which really is about advising the government on uh, the measures and the activities that they're doing in, in terms of the carbon market, um, engagement with stakeholders on the compliance with the regulations, and really coordinating uh, the carbon market, especially and engaging with all relevant stakeholders in, 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 in country. Uh, this framework is not entirely unique to Kenya. So in as much as I'm talking about the Kenyan context and some countries represented here today haven't yet set up, um, don't have regulations, uh, we do see that this is going to be a trend that is going to happen uh, from our other country offices. Either they have draft regulations in place, draft acts in place. There are things that people are looking at, if they're, especially if they are signatories to the Paris Agreement. Um, and so we do see this is going to be something that is going to take off, um, even if you're not currently regulated it's probably in the works in your country. And there are already discussions. A lot of these governments have been participating um, in, in a lot of summits and, 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 and other internationally organized um, events uh, where these things are being discussed and there's a lot of interest. Uh, and so I would not be shocked if we'll be updating you soon, sooner rather than later on what's happening in all other countries. Now, participation in carbon markets. Again, using the Kenyan context, uh, one of the things that was very highly debated and, and discussed when people were looking at our uh, Climate Change Act and the uh, corresponding uh, regulations when they were in their draft forms was uh, having community development agreements. Now, one of the things that is really big in the African context is the fact that previously they have been historical projects that uh, did come um, on continent did do some good things, but also took advantage of communities. Um, and the communities that were involved in the projects or uh, were um, organized 
and, and participating in the projects were not benefiting from, from them. And so that is where the, the idea of, again, the free prior informed consent and uh, that then developed into this community development agreement. So in Kenya, every land-based project that is undertaken on public land, on community land, uh, that would definitely affect the community because it is on public land or community land, uh, has to be implemented through a community development agreement, which outlines um, your relationships, your obligations, but very importantly, how the community is going to benefit financially from the project. So CDAs are a big thing. Initially, um, there was no clarity as to whether every project needed to have a CDA, but then we clarified it in the Kenyan context that it really is in relation to projects that involve public land or community land. And really, we hope that is the, 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 the stance that's going to be taken in other African jurisdictions, because you also want projects to be commercially viable. And so if you say every project has to have a community element, every project has to have some sort of benefit sharing, it might not necessarily always be feasible, especially since some projects are private projects that do for their own private offsetting. Others are um, set up very differently. And so it might not always work that you have a community element. And in the Kenyan context, we've given that clarification and I hope that is the, the the route that other African jurisdictions are going to going to take. So one of the things that you need to know about is this uh, NDC is your nationally determined contributions. So uh, carbon projects in Kenya will be required to state or indicate uh, beforehand if they, in, they in, in, intend to contribute to a country's NDCs. So one of the things I need to talk about NDCs um, for those who in the room who might not know what this means is again under the Paris Agreement, every country has made its own commitment as to how they're going to do their emissions reductions and removals. Uh, and, and they have to account for this. So a carbon project can be contributing to a country's, um, um, uh, I was going to say contributing to a country's contribution, that's, that's using the word twice, but that can be part of the country's um, NDCs or, or not. And so uh, a project registered in Kenya will have to actually document whether it is so that we don't have double counting. We don't have someone um, uh, claiming um, uh, the, the, the credits on this side and then also the, the country itself saying that this is contributing to its NDC. So this is a, 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 a good thing um, and also ensures that there is credibility in the market because it's very clear what is part of the country's NDCs and what is really just for private um, and for the voluntary carbon markets. Um, ongoing carbon projects. So uh, they obviously, whenever you have a new law and new play, act in place, you have, in fact, some people here in this room who already have projects in place, who are already um, in their year three, year four. Uh, and the big question was, what does this mean for me today? This law wasn't in place when I set up my project. And now I have um, another, the law applies and how do I align to it? So the good news is um, there is a two year grace period. A lot of African jurisdictions are common law based and we don't necessarily have retrospective looking laws, meaning our laws don't look back. We have transitional periods. We might have immediate implementation of a law, but a lot of times there's some sort of transitional provision. And so in, in the Kenyan context, they did give a two year grace period to align with regulatory provisions. Um, but in, in between there, there has to be, uh, the, the project has to undergo an environmental audit uh, within six months of the, uh, the regulations coming into effect. Now, the big thing on this one is uh, for a lot of projects, um, they already did have to do an environmental audit. They had to have their environmental impact assessment. So the question everyone asks is, if I had already done one, do I then need to do one to, um, uh, to comply with the regulations because I had I had done an environmental audit and Emma is giving clarification on that. So for now, people are relying on their previous environmental audits um, and there'll be clarification as to whether there needs to be any additional audits. Uh, but for the ones who hadn't done because of the nature of their projects, maybe they weren't drilling, maybe they weren't, it was in a forestry project, there was no re um, requirement for an environmental impact assessment, then they would need to do so. So that one is very clear. And then the annual social contribution, this was a big thing. And this is an, an, a conversation that's actually happening, again, across the continent um, in relation to very many governments. So in some cases, it's not an annual social contribution. I'll explain what that is. Sometimes it's just a straight up tax. Sometimes it's a government uh, coming up and saying they want to have some stake in, in any carbon project. But this is a big element. Uh, African governments trying to figure out how is it that we are going to benefit 
uh, from the projects and also extract some value for ourselves. And so the conversations uh, that are being had with African governments is you still also want the, the foreign investment to come in, you still want the project developers to come in and set up their projects in your country. So you have to make it a conducive environment. And then so uh, the, 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 the conversation should maybe switch to how do we incentivize people, um, tax them the way they, the, any other business would be taxed, and, and then have some sort of um, community benefit sharing uh, scheme, especially in projects that do affect the community in one way or the other. So in the Kenyan context, um, there is something known as an annual social contribution, which is 40% of aggregate earnings. That term was also very controversial because we weren't talking about net earnings, we're talking about aggregate earnings from the previous year. The regulations came again and uh, gave some sort of clarification and said, actually, it, 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 it's not it's less the cost of doing business, which means at least people are going to be able to take out expenses um, uh, when looking at it. So it, in a way, they've, they've ended up giving us net uh, without giving net uh, because of that sort of slight clarification. So 40% of aggregate earnings for land-based projects and then 25% of aggregate earnings from the previous years in relation to other projects. So non-land-based projects <coughs> that uh, would be required to be contributed to the community. And now the good thing, another good thing in relation to our regulations, they gave a clarification that uh, private carbon projects on private land shall not require to, 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 to do this. It really, we are really looking at the kind of projects that, as I said in the, the beginning, would require CDA because it's public land, it's community land. So that was a good clarification that came. Again, hoping that other African governments, some have already passed laws and then backtracked because they realized people started moving away from their countries because they were trying to insist on some sort of compulsory amount that has to be taken out. So businesses that are just setting up or just starting out, on day one already know I have X amount of my earnings that I don't have access to. And, and you find a lot of community-based projects already were giving some sort of benefit sharing. So we, we, we have to do that balance between being commercially viable and enabling and an enabling environment. Um, so further carbon project requirements, this, um, these are things that uh, would apply across the board in very many countries. One of the big ones I want to talk about is free prior informed consent. Um, and so you'll have, again, sometimes very sophisticated project proponents coming in um, to set up a project and you're dealing, if it's a land-based project, it's a forestry project, a forestry restoration and you're dealing with a community who may, might not be as sophisticated, might not fully understand what it is, it is they're signing up to. It is now on the, the people setting up the project to really ensure that the people they are dealing with fully understand what they're getting into, that they, when they consent to it, that it is informed consent. We're not taking advantage of people. And this is something that um, is not unique to the Kenyan context. It's something that you'll find in our international treaties that people have signed up to, and it will be implemented. And the standards that um, are, 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 are being used to, to issue out these credits, this is an issue that that they look at. So it doesn't matter if the project is registered in Kenya or it's registered in Zambia, um, free prior informed consent will be something that will we'll really look and see whether your, your credit is a viable credit or not. Um, now, in our context, we have environmental and social impact assessments. We have actually advice on projects in different African countries, and there is some form of environmental and social impact assessment. It might be called something else, but um, this is also one that we are seeing is, is fairly standard across the board. Uh, some countries, it's just called something else, but you have some sort of assessment that needs to be done uh, that you have to undergo to ensure that um, it, it is viable and it's not it's not causing more harm than good to the environment. Uh, and the social aspect is the one that might not be as consistent um, in all other jurisdictions, but the environmental aspect we're seeing is, 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 is fairly even across the board um, on the continent. Uh, certification, validation, and verification. Uh, I will not talk so much about this because we when I, I'm sure the next guy is talking about monetization we'll talk about this slightly but each carbon project uh, project um, uh, is 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 subject to some form of certification um, on international standards that should be recognized by an international body um, and, and 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 really verified and validated by an independent auditor so they are mm -hmm. 
are there different standards and, and, and different things that are coming into play? Um, in the Kenyan context now, we, we now do have, have our act and regulations and how those are going to interplay with each other because we are not the ones who set up the standards, but we are saying that we need to, you need mm -hmm. to have your project um, certified by some form of international standard. And, and now we are waiting to see if they're going to list up which ones are acceptable, acceptable or not. Um, and then in our case, because I told you in Kenya, we, are, we have our national governments and then our county governments, they have said, stated in our case that the carbon project will now also re be required to get some sort of letter of support from the county in oh, which the, the project is undertaken. So, so not every country uh, represented here is set up in the, in the same way in that you have your national government and your county government, but you might have municipalities, you might have local, um, uh, uh, some sort of local jurisdiction that you'll have to get some, some form of permit on. A lot of times we find even when uh, you're not uh, um, on projects we've, we've advised on that are not necessarily in Kenya, you find that even the best way to have stakeholder engagement is sometimes to go through whatever form of local government there is. And when you have buy-in from them and they understand what the project is, uh, then you, you're able to actually properly engage the community. So even if in our case, it is a statutory requirement, it is something we'll still say in you know, whatever jurisdiction you are, actually having support from local government um, and, and having that sort of engagement uh, really is beneficial to the project and getting things done, especially because there are other permits we need that are not strictly speaking environmental type permits. Now, in terms of development in other African jurisdictions, um, the most recent is uh, South Africa introducing a carbon tax act, which is basically, uh, this, this is now for more for the fiscal side things um, uh, to encourage the reduction of GHG uh, emissions in yeah. South Africa. Now, they, the carbon yeah. tax, just so you know, also in the Kenyan context, this was in our draft fiscal incentives policy. And in our case, um, even part of some of the funding we've received as a country actually has some sort some, some form of requirement of us to introduce this type of things. And so a lot of Africa. Uh, governments are getting um, uh, 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 funding uh, from some international bodies which are putting this so it's it, it's your sustainability linked loans um, and your and your your green bonds and financing the, and the African governments are getting it and they come up with a requirement for them to now implement this so again this might be something we'll see cutting across other African jurisdictions, South Africa now has enacted it, and then they've also enacted their carbon offset regulations. Um, uh, so this is fairly new. We're going to see how it plays out, but projects now need to be registered, um, and you have to use you, you can use to offset the organization if you are an organization in South Africa to offset um, your carbon tax liability. So there, there um, again, that we will see how we are monitoring and seeing how that uh, plays out through our South Africa office. Um, in Tanzania, Tanzania recently adopted um, their own version of the environmental management control management of carbon trading mechanism regulations. That's a very big mouthful. Uh, and so this was to establish now their framework for their own carbon trading, including setting up the national carbon registry. Or I should have said, I should have indicated that also part of our regulation set up a national carbon registry in Kenya to register all projects. And this will help monitor everything that's being done from a country perspective, what goes to our NDCs, which are, are being used for private offsets, but everything will be going into our, our, our registry. So Tanzania has done the same. Um, again, something we're monitoring through our Tanzania office and seeing what the developments are there. Uh, and then in, in Zambia, um, they, there is their carbon, forest carbon stock management regulations, which encourage um, community for, forest management groups which is something we have in Kenya. So in Kenya, we have uh, CFA, so community forest associations. Um, they have community forest management groups. Uh, these, are, these are groups that mobilize um, and, and, and take part in forestry projects, whatever type of projects they are. But then in this case, they can participate in carbon trading. Um, and these regulations also set out the procedure for conducting forest stock, take, stock trading, sorry. Uh, these are, again, 
all fairly new. A lot of the carbon trading regulations across the continent are new. In some cases, um, they have been fairly successful. In others, not so much. Uh, um, I, I, I don't know if I should name specific countries that have had to have got it wrong and are now uh, backtracking. But uh, what we get is when you the big thing is if they come up with something that immediately wants to. Oh. Um, penalize from some sort of tax or, or or take out money from the project from day one. Um, many project developers are like, I'm not really sure I want to set up the project in this country. And in countries that are saying, let's incentivize, let's give incentives, people think that's beneficial and are interested in, 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 in <coughs> encouraging um, uh, uh, foreign investment, then you find then that's a successful uh, law and regulation, because having regulations in place is actually good. You you kind of create a system that people understand and gives people clarity. But over a regulation itself is also not necessarily good for a, a, a market that is setting up or starting out in a country. Um, and so uh, we stop there and I'll check if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Christine. I've seen some questions in the chat, even though Utav has been generously responding to them. Someone was just asking, if, you know, where your South Africa office is. And then okay, there was a so technical question. But people can also raise their hands and uh, ask yeah. questions. And, and I'll also take time and respond to questions um, uh, during the thing. But our South Africa office, we have actually three offices in South Africa, in Durban, Cape Town, and in Johannesburg. And I'll, I'll, I can send a link. Very good. And there was a question. Um, someone was saying the FPIC is still relevant for private land used to. And I think would have responded and says as long as there is a beneficiary community on the private land. Uh, so I don't know wow. if there's any comment on Correct. that. But no, if no, you have no, any questions, have your hand. Yeah. Yeah. Because again, yeah. free prior informed consent really is about, is it affecting the community? Do they understand? Um, and we're trying to ensure that people are not being taken advantage of. So you might have private land projects and really there's, there's no community element in it at all. Um, and actually not even all projects, carbon projects um, involve land per se. So um, if there's a community, do they understand what's happening? Um, and if they've consented to it, have they, have they, has it, is it informed consent? Okay, there was more questions. Uzo, maybe you want to unmute and. I mean, I'm just, we already work in these communities and, you know, we work with the chiefs, youth chairman, elders chairman, you know, you have your council of chiefs. Some people will sign on behalf of lots of other people. I mean, it seems very subjective how you confirm if people understand or not. So I'm curious how this is handled. You give money during the New Yam Festival. You just, yeah. So how does that actually, how does that happen? So um, there, I don't think there's actually any one way that has worked successfully. Um, in It is really the level of engagement. Um, I know of a project where they had, I, I, I feel like if there's if there is one project that did as much engagement as possible with the community, it was them. Um, and at every level, so they met with the women's groups, they 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 had an education campaign, they met with local leaders, uh, they did it at every level. It did not stop a local politician from trying to cause problems, but because they had had such good, meaningful engagement and the community had started seeing financial benefits from the project, even with some people trying to cause problems, the people who came out and spoke for the project was the, was the community itself. And so, um, again, I don't think there's any one way to do it, but I think if you are doing it right and you're trying your best and they see the benefit, you'll find that the community is the one that actually speaks out for you <laughs> of issues. Yeah, it makes sense, makes sense. But then is it like a letter agreement between you and the community and then, then just seeing how you've been interacting over years? Yeah. So um, in, in, in 
the Kenyan context, and that's why I think sometimes regulations is good, this community development agreement will be a good thing to have, right? Because you'll have, um, you'll actually have a document that shows there has been an engagement, we've agreed for this, what is happening. Now the question becomes, who in the community will we be dealing with? Um, so you find for, for example, with um, forestry projects here, if you're dealing with uh, our community, <laughs> benefit organizations or community forest um, associations, that's an easy one. I have a named organization, they're already, they're already organized, they represent the community, that's an easy one to go to. Uh, but in some cases, it's not as easy. So how do I demonstrate this? And it might not be one thing, it might be a group of things that will be able to show and demonstrate. But I don't know if, if, if um, WhatsApp has any other examples that they'll be able to show and demonstrate that there is actually free parent from consent other than um one one okay, okay. Can you... um <laughs> no i think i agree with you christina there's different ways in different contexts uh i think majority of the projects um, either with indigenous population or with farmers so depending as christina said uh, the level of uh, sophistication and understanding of the local community or farmers groups you have to go and engage with them uh, the intention of course uh, is to make sure that there's no challenges they don't feel that they have been excluded from the transaction uh, there is no sense of injustice or or challenges later um, not every project is perfect of course there are challenges but but uh, that is the intention with this and it really matters on who the developers and stakeholders are so that uh, you know the execution is done not only with the letter but also spirit of the organization so um, I think uh, uh, um, of course, you'll read in the news. <laughs> uh, uh, last year, uh, there was a challenge with, I think, a lot of afforestation and reforestation projects, wherein um, the challenge was that the credits that were issued, um, it was seen when they did an independent investigation that <laughs> what was claimed was not, not, not removed. So that's why people lost faith in the credits and and that's why the prices of those afforestation credits crashed so so this is a very price sensitive market it's a evolving market uh things are new things are still being standardized so so uh, a few things are being revised right now uh which will uh, you know build uh, uh the trust in the market and and uh, reduce the suspicions of all the stakeholders so this is one part of just sort of ensuring that at least you engage the community and you don't uh, uh, leave them behind yeah I, i'll just pause there okay thank you utsav and christina do you have any other questions for christina before we get into the monetization piece no Yes, we can also use the chat uh, for further discussions. But right now, thank you so much, Christina. Uh, very insightful. And since you're in different markets, hopefully people will find you also in case they need you know, tailored support. Uh, now we'll go to you, Utav. Um, please take it away. Sure. Thank you, Lord uh, Anisi. And uh, thanks, Christina, for that very helpful introduction. Um, I want this to be a very interactive session. So please feel free to stop me and uh, ask me uh, any questions. We will be going through, first of all, what are the carbon markets? What is their current status? What are the practical takeaways that you can have as entrepreneurs in this space? And then finally, we will also take you through the process of how carbon projects are registered. So um, I, I see that we have a lot of people here from different countries and different sectors. I noticed that we have uh, colleagues from Zambia, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, uh, TZ, South Africa, Rwanda, uh, and of course, Kenya. Um, and uh, people are across different sectors, uh, such as um, biochar, agribusiness, so, uh, solar, um, and, 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 and uh, uh, other areas. So um, <clears throat> is anyone, uh, uh, I will go through the, uh, the slides uh, quickly and uh, uh, I'll focus on the areas which are most relevant to you. If there's anything you would like to understand further, please let me know and I'm happy to uh, elaborate and expand on that. 
So um, everyone already knows that uh, climate change is having a great impact on the economy uh, on the continent. Everything from food security to health to even air pollution, uh, as well as droughts, wildfire, sea level rise, they're all increasing year on year with devastating effects on, on, on uh, people, community and the economy. Uh, we all understand very well the, how this is impacting uh, job security, food security, and just day-to-day -day lives. Um, so the reason why the Paris Agreement of 2015 was signed was to address this climate change. And carbon markets are an important tool which price the carbon, as Christina showed in our video, that one ton of carbon is one carbon credit. So that's how basically uh, uh, when, when you price it and you put a limit to it, then you're able to reduce the carbon which is being released in the atmosphere. So what is the need for carbon credits? It's a mechanism to do a reward those who are doing good things for reducing carbon. And it's a way to uh, um, go beyond just fining people for redu uh, uh, you know, releasing too much carbon. So for example, industry, manufacturing, all of the polluting industries not only do you find them for or, or limit how much CO2 they're emitting, but people who are doing good things like agroforestry or uh, planting mangroves or taking care of mangroves, uh, planting sea kelp, um, all of those things which do good things to sequester carbon, they should be rewarded. So that is the uh, intention behind that. So there are two kinds of uh, carbon markets. There is compliance and there's voluntary. For our discussion, we will be focusing on voluntary. Compliance happens at a much, much larger level and it's typically uh, at the government level or the regional level. So uh, uh, at, at the entrepreneur level and at the uh, business level, we need to be concerned about what carbon credits mean for our business and our project. So, so both are important and both are growing. Both are important tools in the fight against climate change. Uh, and we'll see how that how, how that works. So this is a very, very quick overview of the global carbon market. On the left is the ETS uh, or emission trading scheme, um, which is regulated by governments. On the right is the carbon credit market driven by corporates. So you might have heard that in Kenya, uh, the biggest buyers of carbon credits were companies like Netflix, Apple, Microsoft, they have been buying the credits through the voluntary market. And if you look at the end, the project-based credits, they are certified by uh, third-party agencies such as Plan Vivo, Gold Standard, Vera, uh, uh, and, and Community-Based bio, uh, bio, Biodiversity Alliance. So, so these are a few different sort of standards which are there which give carbon credits at a project level. So these, as entrepreneurs, these are the carbon, uh, you know, th the third party agencies that you need to be concerned about because they are the ones who will be doing the audits. They are the ones whose eligibility criteria you have to meet. And they will be the ones who will be registering your carbon credit so that it can be sold. So the right side is very, very important uh, to you and your business. <clears throat> Just to give you a little bit uh, um, more context, um, the compliance market or the regulated market by governments, it's con it consists of two kinds. There's the cap and trade and there's the carbon taxes. So um, cap and trade means you put a limit on how much uh, industry is allowed to emit. So let's say you have uh, the industry in Nigeria. Um, and uh, it, it, it it's it's let's say let's say it's the trucking industry and let's say that the government says that you're only allowed to trade thousand you know carbon credits uh, you're only allowed to emit thousand you cannot emit more than that because that is your budget and allowance so companies as a whole have to now operate within that thousand carbon credits if they go beyond that then they have to buy carbon offsets. They'll not be allowed to increase their carbon uh, uh, emissions beyond the level which is set by the government. 
the other way which uh, 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 countries try to control carbon uh, uh, emissions is by putting a carbon tax so south africa for example about 2 years ago they put a 10 dollar carbon tax um colombia argentina other countries the eu says that in order to meet the paris uh, agreement goals of uh, you know stopping the temperature increase uh, more than 2 degrees 1.5 degrees we need a carbon price of about um 80 to 9, 70 to 90 dollars uh 70 to 90 euros that is not possible to do in on the african continent because if we do that that means that prices of everything will go up whether it's food whether it's day to day things that you need for going about you know our daily activities if we put a carbon tax of that uh, amount on every economic transaction and every good that means that living will become impossible <clears throat> and already the prices are very 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 high so so what do we mean by uh, the voluntary carbon market and this is driven by companies and the private sector the governments do not monitor this this is entirely based on what microsoft says is going to do to reduce its carbon emissions what amazon says any large company they can decide to do this and it's important to also note that this carbon credit comes after the company has done everything possible to reduce its carbon emissions so first of all even before buying carbon credits a company like microsoft or any large company in kenya nigeria zimbabwe tanzania they have to look at their operations they have to make it as efficient as possible and then beyond that if they cannot reduce the carbon credits they typically buy the uh, carbon credit offsets to ensure that they are meeting their carbon uh, uh, reduction goals um so here's a quick overview of the compliance market so the emission trading system that we talked about uh, from 2019 to 2023 the eu which is the world's uh, second largest uh, carbon uh, trading system they ha have been putting prices of 25 uh, uh, dollars 50 euros uh, 50 uh, uh, dollars and 96 dollars per ton of co2 you can see that uh, china which started in 2023 they put $8 per ton. Why did they do that? Same reason uh, which we just discussed. Because if they make it very, very high as a developing or an emerging economy, it will increase the cost of transactions throughout the economy, which will make things very, very difficult. So as emerging countries and as developing markets, we need to be very, very sure of what kind of uh, measure we are supporting by the government. So currently, uh, China is the world's largest ETS. It manages about five, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, gigatons of uh, CO2, whereas uh, um, it, EU does about 1.4. But together, all the ETSs across the world, they cover just about 20% of the global emissions. So that's why voluntary carbon markets are very important to pick up the, you know, slack and do the, do, do the rest. Uh, Christina had mentioned that countries decide their own carbon emission targets under the NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contributions. Even if we combine the entire world's NDCs, the projected temperature rise of the world is still about 2.7 degrees, which is way more than 1.5. And today in 2024, in the last two weeks, we have already faced about four of the hottest days in history. And we are already about 1.2 degrees, 1.3 degrees over normal. So we have very little time left <laughs> to cross the 1.5. So that is why all of your activities, uh, which are green, which are uh, you know working positively to reduce carbon emissions, they're very, very important to meet the goals of, of reducing CO2 from the uh, atmosphere. This is just a quick map. I won't go too much into this. But you can see that uh, uh, where you have ETS or carbon tax. So on the continent, you can see that uh, you know you have Morocco, Senegal, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Gabon, Botswana, um, uh, with uh, uh, ETS or carbon tax uh, under consideration. South Africa, which has already implemented a carbon tax, um, and rest of the world, uh, the blue is where you can see that majority of the um, ETS schemes are operating. But uh, none of these uh, stop them from uh, participating in uh, voluntary carbon markets uh, as well.
So um, coming to voluntary carbon markets, this market size was about $2 billion in 2022. Um, and it is projected to increase by about 5 to 50 times by 2030. And this is just uh, uh, also the market in uh, Africa, which I'll come to. So there are two important terms you should know uh, in carbon markets. There is the issuance and the retirement. Issuance is when you register your carbon project. So the authority like Vera or Gold Standard, they issue you the carbon credit. And retirement is when that uh, um, um, the carbon credit is finally noted towards the offset. So for example, let's say you have a agroforestry project or a solar project in Zimbabwe. You generate some carbon credits, you sell it to a buyer, the buyer goes ahead and sells it to another uh, uh, buyer. And finally, uh, it reaches an organization which is looking to offset its carbon credits. Once that organization buys it and counts it towards its re reduction, that means that that is the point when it is retired. So, so there is a long journey between the issuance and the retirement. And this is completely tracked on uh, uh, by each and every authority. So if you go to the gold standard website, or if you go to the Vera website, you can see all the projects for your country. You can see which year the project was, uh, the credit was issued. You can see who bought it and you can see finally who retired it. So it's very important to note that until and unless the carbon credit is retired, it is not considered to have, you know, reduced the CO2. So these are just some terms that is important uh, uh, to know and that are important to know when you're considering about carbon credits in the voluntary carbon market. So um, we have about 29 carbon crediting programs and about 17 independent carbon credited mechanisms. Uh, and seven new ones are under development. You might have heard about conversations around biodiversity. So a lot of uh, uh, conversations and standards around uh, how to measure biodiversity is, is also being discussed. Coming to the carbon market size in Africa. So um, the global voluntary market uh, size is supposed to be about $200 billion by um, uh, 2050. In 2022, we just saw that's about $2 billion. So it's projected to grow about 100 times in the next uh, 20, uh, 25 years. Um, the goal for Africa Carbon Markets Initiative is to have 300 million credits retired by 2030, create $6 billion in revenue, create 30 million uh, jobs. They have initiated about 13 action programs to uh, do capacity building of different uh, uh, countries. And they've put in about $200 million to make this happen. And uh, the Africa Carbon Markets Initiative is for the whole African continent in pushing forward uh, voluntary carbon markets. So coming to a little bit about what are carbon credits and, and you know which sectors they can be put in. So there are two things you can kind of things that you can do. Either you can reduce the emission or you can remove the emission. So um, when you are removing, uh, when you're reducing the emission, sorry, please let me know if it's visible. Yeah. Um, you have technological ways, you have natural ways. And in emission removal, again, you have technological ways and natural ways. And there are more than 170 kinds of carbon uh, credit. They range from afforestation. They uh, range from you know clean energy like hydro, solar, biogas, wind. Uh, um, they go into household and community with the cook stoves. Uh, there are chemical and industrial processes. And there are energy efficiency me measures. There are waste disposal measures. There are agricultural measures. So there are multiple, multiple ways in which you can generate carbon credits. And depending on the activity uh, and the demand for that uh, project, um, the pricing of the carbon credit will be determined. So I'll come to a slide later where I will show you what the price of different carbon kinds of carbon credits are. But basically, uh, whoever is buying a carbon credit, they price it more, first of all, if they know that it's authentic 
and second of all if it has additional benefits so social benefits so for example if you have cook stove project then not only are you providing a clean way of cooking you're also removing air pollution which leads to better health outcomes for the households so so that means that along with reducing carbon you have also positively helped the community so that is why clean cooking uh, projects would command a better price than maybe some other kinds of uh, projects so it's very important to think about uh, that and i i note that there are some biochar companies here as well so biochar projects are some of the highest carbon credit earning um, uh, projects uh, i believe the last year i was just checking the prices before this call but the average price globally was about 151 dollars per ton of co2 and in some jurisdictions it can go as high as about 200 uh, uh, dollars per carbon credit so that means that when the average price of carbon credits is about five to seven dollars, this is an extremely, extremely efficient and well-known method of stopping carbon from going into the atmosphere. So if you are in the biochar uh, uh, or any agroforestry project uh, where you are maybe perhaps creating biochar, then uh, this is a very, very good, good option for you. Um, coming to the growth of Africa's carbon markets, in 2022, there was about 22 tons of CO2 retired. The goal for um, 2030 is to retire at least 300 tons and by 2050, uh, retire about 1500. And the, the way the markets are going to be um, you know, designed is to ensure equitable and transparent distribution of the revenue uh, with a focus on supporting the communities. So we talked about the consent, informed consent of the communities, but this programs the uh, for for the continent go further, and they look at uh, distributing the revenue to the communities as well. Uh, this is a quick snapshot of uh, all the issuances in the past five years and the biggest countries with the most uh, uh, carbon credits issued. Uh, so between twenty sixteen and twenty twenty one. You had Kenya as the highest issuer of uh, uh, carbon credits, followed by um, Zimbabwe. Then you had DRC, you had Ethiopia, and finally Uganda. These were the top five markets uh, uh, issuing carbon credits on the continent. And the uh, sectors in which these were issued were more than 74% uh, uh, in forestry, 27.4% um, in household devices, which is basically clean cooking, uh, about 11% in uh, solar and others. So you can sort of start seeing a trend that uh, um, where which, which uh, sectors have, have a very, very high potential for carbon credits. <clears throat> Having said that, there are a lot of sectors where carbon credits can be generated and, and they're, uh, they're all at different stages uh, of, of growth. So um, the ones in orange especially are ones which are still very, very new. So you see that nature-based solutions like agroforestry, uh, no or low-till agriculture, peatlands, savanna fire management, salt marsh, mangrove, blue carbon, all these uh, waste management, um, uh, bioenergy, biochar, these are all really, really high potential uh, areas for the continent uh, to uh, take up in, in terms of uh, uh, very, very attractive carbon credit projects. Um, so uh, this is like a basic of trading. When you have a, a, a carbon credit transaction, you of course have a buyer and seller. So I would like you all to focus on uh, the lower right side of the uh, the page, what should you be aware of as a seller? So as, as a project developer and an entrepreneur, you need to be very, very sure of what is the price that you're getting for your carbon credits. You need to understand how much uh, is the demand? What volume? Is someone looking for 100 credits, 500 credits, 1000 credits for how many years? What kind of guarantees or penalties are they asking for on the transaction? How will the timing of the delivery be? Um, what is the risk uh, for the buyer, uh, for, uh, for, for you to interact with the buyer? Uh, what are the key responsibilities in the transaction? And depending on who you sell it to, is it an NGO? Is it a, a, a carbon exchange? Is it the government? 
they will all have different criteria uh, and uh, uh, appetite and limits so uh, it's very very important that as an entrepreneur uh, you really really think about who you're selling it to uh, and whether you're getting the right price i'll give you an example of a company in kenya um they were approached by a european company for buying biochar from them they were offered a price of about 50 dollars when we just discussed that the average price you know is as high as 150 to 200 dollars so if they had taken up the deal they would have <laughs> lost more than per carbon credit you know 150 dollars they would have uh, at least 100 dollars they would have lost but uh, they went out on their own and uh, they uh, decided to try for themselves and they were able to get a price of about 85 to 100 dollars uh, so much better than the 50 dollars that they were getting so so i think uh, it's really really important to do a little bit of homework uh, just to see what are the options available for you and not not blindly believe uh, whatever developers or or you know other people a lot, lot of the companies have very very aggressive targets so um, same as any marketing or sales company they will be coming out and telling stories but uh, with a little bit of digging you would be able to tell for yourself that what is the right price for your project in 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 the market and then that's very important I'll briefly go into um, the uh, carbon credit uh, uh, creation process, but uh, are there any questions so far from anybody? Um, okay, I don't hear any questions. Feel free to add them in the chat, but uh, I'll just go through this uh, in the meanwhile. So carbon, uh, credit creation and again i would like you to look at the right column it's a very simple seven steps you have the project design you need uh, uh, the uh, approval uh, it depends on which country you're in now more and more african countries uh, are starting to put in procedures uh, for uh, having the national carbon registry which will manage and record all the uh, projects that happen in the country um, but this is still not fully operational yet in many, many countries. Number three, you have validation. So Vera, Gold Standard, other or the third party agencies that we mentioned, they have to come and validate your project to show see that what you have done is actually uh, according to the you know registered methodology. Finally, after validation, you do the registration. After this, your project is monitored. So, uh, for example, agroforestry projects can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, generating credits for over a period of 10 years. So once you have a 10 year project, then every year the third party verifier needs to come and make sure that the forest land which you have set is still there. It's not been reduced. The community has not encroached. Some part of it hasn't been sold off for, let's say, building, uh, you know, some other assets. So all of that needs to be done in the monitoring and verification phase. And then finally, um, the uh, based on the reports, the boards issue the carbon credits. Uh, here is uh, the whole process in a little bit uh, more detail. So um, these are all the things that happen in the background. So in the beginning, where, where most of us might be is the project idea. Based on this, we need to do a feasibility study. For this, you might need to uh, uh, you know uh, get some financing. Um, and then you would get the uh, uh, you, you would get the uh, project commissioned and finally you're going to have the operations which are reducing the carbon uh, emissions so there is someone who helps you prepare the project documentation there is the auditor who looks and validates the project documentation then you go ahead with the registered process which is approved by the right carbon standard and then the program uh, monitors the activities of the project again, which are audited. Um, and and uh, finally, this information is now updated on the standard as well as the carbon registry. So this is the typical process. So anyone who's worried about this being a scam or, or, or people making money of this, I, I'll not say that those cases don't exist. But uh, what I want to uh, also say is that 
the whole process behind this has been quite quite well thought out and there is a scientific uh, reason behind each and every methodology whether it's biochar uh, solar uh, off grid solar mini grids energy efficiency each uh, uh, process has got a very very detailed methodology behind it and finally when you go through this whole process um the way you can uh, make uh, the final monetize uh, your carbon credits is to find the buyers and there are different kinds of buyers there might be carbon trade exchanges uh, like in singapore which buy on behalf of other parties uh, it's it's like any other market uh, when the farmer is selling potatoes he's not selling it directly to us he's selling it to some intermediary who who brings it to the market from the market it comes to the supermarkets and then you know we can buy it uh, from uh, uh, the mama bogas in kenya or uh, uh, a carrefour or or, or a quick mart or a different uh, you know uh, area so basically whether it's potatoes or carbon credits <laughs> it passes through many many hands before it reaches the final uh, buyer uh but the whole process is is monitored and and once you sell your carbon credit i think credit, we lost utsa uh, uh am i audible can anyone else hear him sorry yes i can hear him yes yeah, i can still hear you okay okay uh, An anizi can you hear me um okay i hope her audio is fine uh, but as long as others can hear please uh, i i will go on um so that's the whole process i'll give an example of a agroforestry project now so um basically agroforestry uh, helps in remove the co2 from the atmosphere by storing it within the ground so either it is stored within trees it is stored on in plants or it is stored in wood or it is stored in the soil so um uh, the the methodology looks at all these kind of different uh, things within a project area to measure how much co2 is being uh, saved by the, by a agroforestry project and and for agroforestry these are the different standards which exist um so you have vera you have plan vivo you have biocarbon you have gold standard you have social carbon you have a lot of different uh, um um uh, projects and these are the sdgs which uh, an agroforestry uh, helps achieve uh, from uh, building sustainable communities improving livelihoods to preserving environment so if you're in agroforestry then uh, uh, basically you need to go through this entire process of the feasibility study uh, to uh, understand how many how many carbon credits will your project produce um i'll go a little bit detail into uh, an example of a technical feasibility uh, and and just to let you know what is the cost and timeline of such a process so this was a client who came to us who had biomass boilers and they wanted to use this biomass boilers to replace diesel boilers uh, and and fossil fuel boilers at multiple locations so um we do two things for them as part of the feasibility we do a technical feasibility and we do a financial feasibility in the technical feasibility first of all we see that which is the carbon standard and methodology which is matching to that project activity which is in this case is a biomass boiler once we select that standard uh, we look at the uh, methodology which will be applied and based on the applied methodology we do a baseline uh, uh, assessment so basically in baseline assessment we simply see that when did the project start and since it start per year how many uh, uh, how much co2 has it been reducing so if you have started your project let's say 2 years ago you can even apply for retroactive uh, carbon credits so you can even get carbon credits for your project activities in the past as long as you are able to prove that you have done that activity and reduce that carbon from the atmosphere um of course uh, there needs to be a site visit they need to needs to be an assessment of land ownership plot size uh, beneficiaries uh, what are the regulations and policies etc all that needs to be decided uh, when this measurement is being done and based on this you'll get to know that okay my project is going to uh, generate 100 carbon credits or 1000 carbon credits so you have to do this technical feasibility for your business to understand how much carbon credit can be generated 
Um, and this is a pretty standard process. There'll be a lot of people who will be doing this. And based on this, uh, you can, what we also support with is doing the financial feasibility. So we let you know that what will be the cost of doing the project? What will be the revenue? And is the revenue worth it? Should you be doing this? Are the carbon credits going to be too less? It doesn't make sense to do it and go ahead. Or is the revenue substantial to help you with your business over time? And finally, who will own the uh, carbon credits and how will the revenue distribution be done? As uh, Christina also mentioned in a presentation, a lot of governments want that the carbon credit proceeds should go to the um, should go to the uh, project developer and the local community. In Kenya, uh, about as she mentioned, 40%, 25% of the project if for land and non-land has to go to a community development fund. In Zimbabwe, they have put a tax of about uh, 30% for carbon projects, which now has to be given to the government. So um, different countries have different rules. Uh, but but the broad idea is to understand that you as a business owner, when you're operating, whether it's Nigeria, TZ, South Africa, according to the laws of your country, how, men, how much revenue will you be finally making? And that depends on all of these uh, different things. So, so broadly, uh, this feasibility study is a very, very important first step, even if before you go for carbon credit registration, to understand how how uh, this will support you um i won't go into these this is just a little bit about uh, what i mentioned at the beginning that uh, these are the core principles that uh, um, buyers usually look for that it should be real it should have an actual benefit um, it should create more uh, you know, uh, benefits for the community it should be a long term project all of that it should not hurt anybody these are the core principles which should be followed in every project. Um, so uh, I'll quickly come to the prices of different carbon credits. So as I mentioned over here, um, some projects generate more credits than others. So you can see that here we have wind, we have afforestation, we have tree planting, we have clean cook stores. So um, the average price uh, you can see of tree planting is 7.5. It can range from 2.2 to $20. Um, if you do agroforestry, the average price is 9.9 .9 because again, the community benefit is much, much more. Um, the uh, energy eff uh, efficiency, which is community focused also has a very, very high price. And then uh, fuel switching also, also has a very, very high price. So the price really depends on what is the activity and what is the benefit. So uh, whenever you are considering generating uh, pro uh, your carbon credits, um, you need to see that which ones are being sold at what price and what is the benefit. These are a few things that have to be considered and impact the pricing of the credits that you'll be generating, which will finally determine how much revenue you make. Uh, I see, Uzo, you have a question. Um, This table, is it? It's not standardized per ton of each, is it? Or is it like saying wind, I do 12.8 and then I get 1.9 per ton or just, uh, it's a bit confusing. Sure, sure. This is a just 12.8 is the volume uh, and then you have the price and then you have the price range. So this is a snapshot of a few years ago. Uh, it may not be true today. But uh, year on year, there are different uh, indexes which track uh, what is the price of different activities. So um, um, I'm going to share two links uh, at the end of this call. Uh, one is a link for Africa Carbon Markets 2024 update uh, just released in June this year. So you'll be able to find these things, uh, the latest values. And the other is uh, uh, all the list of methodologies at a small scale. Uh, whether it's energy efficiency, biochar, agroforestry, which is applicable for, uh, uh, you know, all of your businesses. So um, I hope that will help. But this is just to give you an idea of the different prices that exist for different activities. Uh, yes, Omar, uh, please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much for the fruitful presentation. It's been really insightful. I just have a question regarding the prices here we have, like the average price for wind is $1.9. This is per ton or per per what? Yes, yes, yes. It's per ton of CO2, per, car per carbon per, credit. It's $1.9? Yes. 
this is a this is a old value it may not be uh, 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 correct anymore uh, so uh, I, i would just take this with a with a pinch of salt Oh, okay yeah okay so so for example improved forest management it's it's two dollars um that's the price range between two to two dollars and seventeen dollars per ton yes yes okay this also depends now from uh you know which geography what project uh uh the projects were undertaken but broadly this is to give you an idea of uh the demand and pricing Yes, thank you. Uh, another question: Would you be sharing the uh, presentation with us after the session? Yeah, Or sure. Is... Uh, I can share it with Anisi. Not a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So broadly, I think that is uh uh it. I don't. I'm not going to go through all of this. Um. But uh, uh let me just share the two links uh, with everyone in the chat. Um. And and you can go through it. Uh, but i'm happy to take any more uh, questions this is the um please let me know if you can all see it this is the carbon markets update mm -hmm. yes what's up we can see the links and the second one is all the methodologies um which uh, uh, are are there basically from biodiesel plant oil solar cooker energy efficiency um i think everyone who's joined in today <laughs> should be able to find their uh, methodology there because i just checked it before this call uh, yes uh, e waste itself may not be there specifically abdul uh, uh, but uh, waste management i believe is there um, there is destruction of hazardous waste um, and then waste management is there so you can just have a look but yes so broadly uh, uh, as intellicap what we do is we support companies with end to end uh, project development uh, and our intention is to build the entire ecosystem so at the end of the day uh, for entrepreneurs like yourself it becomes easier to find the right information and then be able to actually use it in your business um is there anyone over here who would like to talk about uh, where they are uh, in their process of uh, uh, their project if, if if you could take maybe 2 minutes and just describe what is your project and and uh, um uh, what is your interest i i can uh, you know just share some thoughts on that is there anyone who would like to talk about their business and share uh, yeah. their I love to. Hi, okay. my name my name is my name is Mamur. Uh, sorry, you're on mute. Please go ahead, Mamur. Yes. Um. <clears throat> so my my company we we are starting a new project to make um clean energy charcoal briquettes because the baseline in Liberia is that people have to cut down trees to make charcoal. Um, and so now we're trying to use agricultural waste to make charcoal as a replacement for uh, for wood charcoal. Um, but we haven't done anything at all yet. You know, we're just trying to figure out like how would we develop such a, such a project and 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 um and monetize on the carbon market. Sure, thank you, uh, Mahmoud. Uh, great question. So yes, there is a particular methodology for it. Whenever you decide to start, and you decide what is the project boundary, uh, as in, uh, what is the size, what is the capacity, how much will you be producing on uh, a monthly or a yearly basis, um, accordingly, uh, this methodology can be applied. Uh, there are existing methods for measuring uh, uh, biomass, biochar from agri waste. so uh, definitely something applicable can be found so uh, but it really depends once you have decided what the activity is okay i have two more questions please sure, um sure. so for, firstly is um the pricing is it is it like a once of kind of pricing or is it is it based on maybe the co2 sequestered per year so is it like an annual price uh that's a great question uh the pricing is uh, per uh, the ton of co2 so 
against each ton of CO2 that you have sequestered, there will be one carbon credit. The price of that carbon credit now depends on whether you have a biochar project or a solar project or a wind project or an agroforestry project. Okay. So the pricing matters on the activity, not the uh, uh, quantity. Uh -huh. Okay. Quantity, of course, also matters uh, uh, when it's large enough, but uh, it's more on the activity which decides what the pricing will be. Okay, so 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 basically, you 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 sell it one time and that's it. Uh, so the carbon credits are generated every year. Every because, year. Because okay. uh, if you are, let's say, using solar instead of diesel, right, to power your uh, motor or 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 your factory, mm -hmm. then. What's happening is earlier you might have been using 1000 liters of diesel per month, but now you're not using zero because now you have a solar power plant. So right, right. the person who will be measuring your uh, business activity will see that, oh, okay, you have been running this factory for two years. You have saved about, uh, you know, uh, 24,000 uh, liters of uh, uh, diesel. So that means that that is much how much CO2 you have saved. So you will get mm. that much amount of carbon credit revenue. Okay. That's, it's on a yearly basis. Yeah. Thank you so much. The, the the final question I have, I'm not sure if you can speak to that, but if we if we were to say we were to, we were to approach um your organization or your company to to work with us to develop our projects, can you give us a range of like what can we expect in terms of uh what what is ballpark what is it going to cost, um and and how long it, it takes from having this initial conversation to when we start trading. Sure, that's a great question. So um, as I showed you in that uh, feasibility assessment, which is the first step, that can take anywhere between one month to two months, depending on the project size. If it's a very small project, you know, we just have to go to one site, we have to see, we have to talk to people. That can take maybe even a few weeks. But typically, mm. I would say uh, one to two months. If it's a large agroforestry project, you have to go visit a lot of farms, you have to travel to different states, uh, different counties. Um, that if it takes more time, then uh, it might take about you know one to two months. Then the project registration itself is a whole separate process. So first you do the feasibility and then you do the actual project registration in which a whole set of documents has to be created. So the first part uh, to answer your question can take between one to three months uh, or four, depending if mm. it's very large. And the second part uh, can take even longer. It can take very little if it's a solar project, but if it's an agroforestry project, uh, again, with like large forests, which have to be monitored, it can take anywhere between, uh, I would say, uh, four to eight months or even a year. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a difficult time. And do you have any any estimates about cost? Sure, sure. So uh, we have a very, very different model. And I think uh, Carl Jensen also uh, asked this question earlier that how do we uh, divide the pie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, our uh, view as IntelliCap is very simple. We want to ensure that majority of the project revenue goes to the project beneficiaries. So uh, we don't charge more than, um, so what we do is we have a simple cost for the feasibility study, wherein we just charge for the people who we assign to do the study and maybe the travel and stay, uh, which is very, very basic. Um, for the project registration, we take a percentage of the revenue, uh, but it's typically capped at 10%. We don't take more than 10%. We have a project fee uh, and a uh, um, and a, a share of the carbon credits. If it's a very big project, we reduce our share of carbon credits. So we can even go down to like 8%, 5%. But typically, uh, we take about 10%. Uh, uh, In the market, uh, most of the companies who are operating, uh, they can take anywhere between 30 to 40% of all the carbon credits. So, so um, but... Uh, our model is 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 different. Um, uh, Uzo, I can share with you our uh, carbon credit credentials, uh, so you can see how many projects we have brought to market. Uh, we are in very early stage in doing deals on the continent. Most of our projects are there in uh, India uh, at the moment, but we are actively looking at uh, 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 projects on the continent as well. And I'm based in uh, Kenya, so I, I uh, speak with a lot of people who are doing different kinds of projects. Um, and uh, to answer your question, we have brought more than 15, 20 projects uh, to uh, the market uh, from uh, agroforestry, livestock, 
we have even done plastic credits um uh, so we have done many many different kinds of methods uh, omar sorry you've had your ha hand up for a long time uh, please go ahead that's okay no worries no worries um i just wanted to add um or i, I just wanted to run my project or the idea that i have in mind uh, by you if uh, we still sure, have sure. yeah yeah, sure. We are specialized. We 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 are specialized in hydroponics and soil agriculture applications. We uh, provide um, the designs for the greenhouses or for the hydroponic systems needed for cultivation. Um, what we have in mind is that we want to um, get one of our designs, uh, for example, for the strawberry uh, NFT. That's a technology in soil agriculture design to um, to 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 get it accredited or to measure how carbon credits we uh, save or we actually absorb because of the sequestration. Uh, you've made the process pretty clear when it comes to. Uh, and 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 um and 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 who can help us through the process and the steps? Thank you so much for that. My question is, uh, have you ever had any projects like this before in hydroponics or in um, in smart uh, sustainable agriculture or soil agriculture? And um, if you didn't um, uh, been through this process before, would you have any recommendation for us or any suggestions? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Omar. Uh, so from my understanding of hydroponics, and this is very basic uh, uh, based on, you know, what we have spoken with many, many different companies, um, you have, of course, you're producing the uh, strawberries or lettuce or plants with very, very li little water and very, very little soil. You're optimizing the drip irrigation and uh, other uh, technology. I don't know where you plant these hydroponics. Is it in a container or is it something else? But basically, we would have to understand your whole business model. And typically, in a hydroponics business or a agri business, you have the uh, uh, three, four things. You have the fertilizer use, you have the soil use, you have the energy consumption uh, in terms of during the production phase. Uh, how are you powering your hydroponic system? And post that, how are you doing the storage, transportation, and handling? So to ensure that the fresh produce reaches the market, are you what kind of refrigeration are you using? And in case the cost of that, the simplest thing over there, Omar, is if you are doing the energy uh, calculation of the production process, storage, transport, and and uh, uh, using you know solar powered cold storage instead of diesel. <coughs> Um, then probably there you have a lot of opportunity to uh, uh, reduce CO2 emissions. Um, uh, you don't need much soil and fertilizer for hydroponics. So uh, I think that's a huge benefit itself. If you can, uh, there are methodologies which look into fertilizer emissions. So nitrogen emissions caused by fertilizers. Um, so, so I think multiple, depending on the size of your and scale of your operations, multiple methodologies would apply. Uh, but we would need to understand your business model and project boundary end to end from the beginning to the end. What all do you do? Which activities qualify? And then we'll be able to give you a complete picture of, of you know, the carbon. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you so much. Uh, we actually fit in the part of the nitrification of the fertilizer because we we take care of this. We don't have any nitrification in the process. And we also, uh, even though we don't have solar panels, we have the sequestration and the, the supply chain, which is um, minimized or the emission of this process is minimized to the um, lowest it can get. So thank you so much. No problem. I see there's a question from Solomon who's asking, have we done any biochar biomass project in Africa? Uh, we are in talks, Solomon, with a few people. Uh, we have given them our project proposal. Uh, we haven't done this, but we do have experience with applying the methodology. So um, it's not a challenge. Um, and Solomon, you're, I believe, Uzo's colleague, because I see relief in uh, both uh, the names. Yeah, and uh, Uzo, I hope I answered all of your questions as well. Okay, okay, great. Um, Dupe is asking, can your project qualify for multiple carbon credits given different SDG targets or is there a maximum limit? And also, would you recommend prioritization? Uh, so great question, Dupe. Uh, yes, I would recommend prioritization because not every project activity would give you the revenue. 
you should prioritize those projects which will give you the highest revenue for the least amount of effort because at the end of the day this is not your core activity <laughs> you want to focus on running your business you want to focus on doing what you're doing and this is a uh, nice to have uh, which is you know extra revenue stream when uh, 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 the economy goes down or bad uh, even if your main operations, uh, the uh, profits reduce, at least you know that you're still getting that carbon revenue. <laughs> so that's how I look at it. I call it a non-operational revenue or a extra revenue stream. Um, uh, and and this stuff should uh, you know be done as easily and simply as possible. So you get it out of the way and you can focus on your main core business. <laughs> that, that that's I think a practical way of sort of looking at it because this is a lot of jargon there's a lot of confusion there's a lot of people saying many many different things but how can we simplify this for you so that it works for you it has to work for you it should not confuse you that's the intention at the end of the day uh, 8% of CRU sales from your team would be entitled is it of the total sum revenue sold per project or of the implementing partner share uh, uh samira great question so um it's of the total uh sum of the project but uh, uh depending on whatever project activities we finally decide that can always be negotiated so it's a negotiable sum uh and having said that we are giving preferential pricing and discounted pricing to a lot of our clients uh, because we want to grow the relationship and we want to grow the business. Um, um, so, so it's not a fixed amount. It really depends on, on the project. And uh, of course, our intention is to ensure that the money goes to the beneficiaries. I hope that answers your question, Samira. Uh, I'm just checking. Francine from Muniaxco had also asked about the right information for carbon credits. Um, Francine, would you like to repeat your question or have I answered it? If you're still there on the call. Um, yeah. I don't see her struggle dropped off. Yeah. No worries. No worries. Great. Um, that's all from my side. I am available. I've shared my uh, email ID. I'll just share it again. Um, if you have any further questions, you can uh, okay. definitely ask. And I hope you find the uh, two links also uh, very, very helpful and useful. If you need any further clarification, um, I'm available on email, LinkedIn, and Anise has my <laughs> contact as well. Uh, a any questions, Anise, would you like to ask everyone? Um, and I and I highly recommend all of you to uh, just be very, very clear. Of course, I'll share the presentation, but uh, uh, I would recommend that you think about what are your next steps. Uh, now that you understand this process, how are you going to take it and make it work for your business? I think that's the question uh, to ask uh, uh, for yourself. And then, uh, of course, if you need any clarity or support, uh, we're always there uh, to answer. Thank you so much. This was great and very nice to meet with and connect with all of you. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much, Utsa. Thank you so much, Christina and team for doing this. It was very insightful, uh, very practical information packed, of course. Uh, so I guess my quick question to everyone, because I could see that there are people who are really ahead in the process. I mean, also your questions were really you know, specific, which tells me that you guys have already done a lot to either go to market, uh, probably done initial feasibility. Uh, so I'm wondering, is everybody clear? Did you get the value you needed out of this? Um, are you drowning in information? If maybe you're very new to carbon credits, so if you can get quickly in the chats, feedback from people. And um, what you know you got out of this, that would be great. We'll share the recording, the presentations. Um, of course, I'm assuming they're not for circulation. So if you can just use it for your teams, that would be great. Uh, and then the emails of our facilitators as well, in case you need to reach out in the future. But we're just very curious to hear quickly, a quick reflections on what you got out of this. Uh, but Utsav and Christina was really spot on. It's very insightful. So thank you.
Any final volunteers feedback? Samira, you seem unmuted. I don't know if you want to say something. Okay, so Uzo says, I didn't know the local regulations were so important. Now you know. And if you want to know more, you can definitely reach out to Bowman's. Um, yes, and actually, actually, that would be a question I would have as much as I don't particularly run a business. But like if you, in, you gave examples of Kenya, I think uh, Zambia, you know, specific markets. But if someone has a question about their market, like if you're from Angola, or from Mozambique and you want to double check and see um what the regulation is in your country and it's all you know readily available I think you can always reach out to Bowman's or Intelicap for supports. Uh, there's one feedback? question uneasy from uh Lucy. Lucy was asking mm -hmm. uh she has a manufacturing business so uh for how how can they take advantage of carbon credits so um, she sent it to me directly, so it's not on the group chat. Ah, uh, so uh, to answer your question, Lucy, if your manufacturing process is using any sort of power generation, which is diesel or uh, fossil fuel based, and if you replace that with solar, then your business can become eligible for carbon credits. I think your core business, uh, uh, which is the distribution of, uh, I think, sanitary uh, uh, pads, um, it may not be directly uh, related to carbon credits, but of course, in your manufacturing and production process, uh, if you're using any fossil fuels, then you can use solar or other things to reduce your carbon credit impact. So yeah, I hope that helps you, Lucy. Thank you so much. I got it. All right. I think we can call it a day. Um, thank you so much. Uh, if we ever need to do this in the future, we can always uh, organize something similar. Uh, but this, you know, from where I'm standing, was very value packed. The questions were also good and made it engaging. So thank you once again to our partners, Telecap and Bowman's, for putting this together and for heroes uh, and entrepreneurs for your questions. Until next time, uh, please reach out to us if you have any questions or reach out to the facilitators. Um, I would really hope this was valuable to you. And I'm wishing you all a good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. If someone is asking that we organize for different speakers, definitely something to consider. All right. Thanks, sure. everyone. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Have a nice evening. Have a nice Bye. day, everyone. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye.